Okay, so in this video, we're going to go through uh, the kinetic theory of gases, and we're going to try uh, to come up with a really simple equation that explains how gases behave in the real world. And this is one of the most beautiful and elegant and incredible pieces of physics that you're likely to come across at A-level. It's also one of the hardest. It's beautiful because we're going to take some really, really simple principles. And that's what's very important to remember as we go through this. The principles that we're dealing with are actually very, very simple. Um, we're just using kind of year 10 level uh, moment uh, understandings about moments and impulse. And we're just going to apply them together with a bit of maths. The maths maybe gets to year 10 level as well. So nothing that we're going to do is terribly complicated. However, because we're chaining together so many different bits of physics, um, it can seem really intimidating at the start. So when you're watching this video, it is vital that you pause it and think about what's happening at each stage. Do not try to just watch this in one go and think you're going to get it, because you won't. You have got to stop, go back and say, OK, that bit doesn't make sense. I'm going to look at it again. And if you do that, you are going to understand this. So follow me through and just remember, nothing that we're doing is terribly hard. So we're going to kick off by thinking about the experimental gas laws. The experimental gas laws are Boyle's law, the pressure law, and Charles's law. And in your last lesson, you actually went and you found those three laws. So to summarize them, Boyle's law, um, the first thing you should be thinking of is a graph. And it is a graph of the pressure in a gas when you change its allowed volume. And what we find is we get a curve that looks like this. Now that, if you think about it, makes total sense because if I try and make my volume become zero, my pressure is going to go up and up and up and up and up. Um, obviously, I can't have a truly infinite pressure because I can't actually get a truly zero volume. The, the gas has to take up some space. If I make my volume larger and larger and larger and larger, then obviously my pressure is going to keep dropping. However, my pressure can never reach zero because there's always going to be some particles crashing into the walls. So that's Boyle's law. The pressure law tells us that the volume of a gas uh, is directly proportional to its temperature. So what we see is something that looks like this if we say that uh, the temperature starts at zero kelvin as long as we're working in kelvin we get that shape and finally charles's law charles's law talks about the pressure and the temperature of a gas and again at zero kelvin we would expect a gas to have zero pressure and for it to scale linearly. Now, these are experimental laws. Yes, they seem kind of obvious as well, but you can prove these really simply with the experiments that we did in class. So what we're going to do now is use those laws to set up a couple of equations. So for Boyle's law, this equation here has the general form of pressure is proportional to 1 over the volume. Now, if we just use a simple bit of maths, we're going to say, OK, that means that pressure is equal to some constant divided by the volume, or pressure times volume is a constant. For the pressure law, I'm going to say that volume is proportional to temperature, or I can just rewrite that as volume is equal to K temperature, or volume divided by temperature is a different constant. Uh, I'm just going to label these K1, K2, so constant 1, constant 2. And then for Charles's law, that tells me that pressure is proportional to temperature, pressure is equal to some constant times temperature, so pressure divided by temperature is another constant. Now, these constants don't have to be the same, they could be different for each gas, but I know that they're always going uh, to be the same, provided I'm using the same container of gas. So, I've got these three equations, and what we're going to do now is try to combine them. Uh, and that turns out to be surprisingly easy to do. What we're going to say 
is there's absolutely no reason that I can't multiply together all three equations. So I'm just going to call that equation 1, equation 2, and equation 3. And there's nothing in maths that says I can't do equation 1 times equation 2 times equation 3. Nothing at all. So let's do it. Equation 1 is PV, and that is equal to some constant 1. I can multiply that by equation 2, which is P over T. So I multiply that by the constant over there. And then finally, I get V over T. So I get my third constant here. Now, if I collect those terms, I get P squared V squared over T squared is equal to a constant times a constant times a constant. Now, those three together, they're still going to be a constant. So I can say then that uh, over here I'm going to collect the terms and I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to take square roots of both sides. So I end up with PV over T is a new constant. Okay, it's not the same as the constants I've got before, but actually I can quite easily find it. All I have to have done um, is taken, done these experiments, found k1, found k2, found k3, and if I want to find what this constant is, um, then all I've got to do is multiply the constant there by the constant there by the constant there, square root it, and, well, sorry, multiply them all together, then square root it, and I've got a unified gas equation. This equation will work for any gas. Uh, I might have to find a different constant for a different gas, but it'll work. So I'm looking at this equation, um, and we can start to say, well, let's let's make this into a bit more of a let's, let's start to find uh, what's going on with this constant over here. What will that depend on? Um, and it turns out for any gas, the only thing that really affects it is the number of particles. And again, this is kind of completely logical. If I put more particles in there, um, you'd expect that the pressure would increase. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say PV over T is equal to N times a constant. And that constant is going to be um, something that uh, just tells us how these numbers are related. Now, a quite profound and interesting effect of gases is that this number is always always, always the same. And that seems surprising um, until you start thinking about some of the principles of kinetic theory and gases in a little bit more detail. But for now, um, it is, you're, you're perfectly welcome to think, well, wow, that's, that's weird, why is every gas the same? Um, but it turns out it doesn't matter uh, how dense the gas, well, it doesn't matter how dense the gas is because the density affects N, obviously, um, but it doesn't matter on the weight of the gas, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's monoatomic, diatomic, or something really complicated and organic and horribly chemistry, it's always the same. So we give it uh, the name the molar gas constant. And it's pretty easy to find, uh, all you need to do is, like we did previously, carry out the three gas experiments uh, and then just plug it into this equation. Now that means that this n here must be the number of moles of gas. There is an alternative form of this equation. The alternative form is PV over T is equal to a capital N uh, times a constant. And in this form, we call the constant the Boltzmann constant. Um, and this is the form that is probably slightly more widely used at A-level. Um, in this one, N is the number of particles. Now this is probably the uh, most common mistake that students make, is, use, is getting confused between the Boltzmann constant and the molar gas constant. So if you're getting weird, peculiar answers, like you're getting pressures of 10 to the negative 30, uh, 
uh, Pascals, there we go, <laughs> Pascals, um, or you're getting volumes slightly larger than the observable universe, um, chances are you're using the wrong constants, so that's a little hint. Obviously, um, we can't just write constant, that's not very physics-y. So the last thing we're going to do is just tally up these equations. So we're going to turn them into two ways. Uh, and this is the standard way that you'll see it written. The first one is we're going to say PV is equal to little m times a, a constant r times t. Uh, so that is the molar form of the equation. Uh, and for reasons known only to physicists, we tend to multiply that t across to the other side. Um, I guess so it fits on one line and looks nice and pretty. Uh, the alternative version is PV is equal to capital M times a lowercase r times t. Um, no, that's lowercase k, what am I talking about? Uh, PV is mkt. So those are the two different forms. Um, the way that I tend to remember it um, is that it's a little m which means that it's moles, because it's a smaller number. Now, this n is always going to be massive, because it's a number of particles. This n is a number of moles, so it's going to be a much more reasonable, more natural number. All right, so what can we actually do with this equation? Well, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and find the speed of a particle. Now, this is one of those things where you kind of just got to bear with me and plug on through this maths. There's going to be points where it's not going to make any sense at all, but trust me, you're going to get there. So, we're going to start off with some key assumptions. Uh, and these assumptions are pretty important for understanding how these gas laws work, and we're going to come back to them again and again as we go through. So, assumption one is that we are dealing with some point particles. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that the particles act as though they exist in just a single point in space. I'm also going to assume uh, that they're very small compared to the distances between them. Uh, and that's also going to turn out to be very important um, for a lot of the things that we're doing to make sense. Second thing is they will never attract each other. And again, that doesn't seem immediately obvious why that should be, um, but hold on, um, it will make sense that basically you want to isolate uh, these particles from any effects um, of the other particles nearby them. We want them to act like single individual things. Um, third thing, uh, we're going to assume that they move randomly. Um, why would they move randomly? Well, we've done a lot of this when we're thinking about Brownian motion. Uh, we see that there doesn't seem to be any preferred direction of travel. Now, that's sometimes a bit of a lie. Obviously, uh, gravity is acting downwards, so there is sometimes a slight preferred direction of travel, but it turns out that it doesn't actually um, make all that much difference. And again, for the maths to work, we have to assume that there really isn't. Um, so that's probably the... Um, the biggest lie in what we're doing here. These, this maths that we're going to be doing does work, um, but the fact that they move randomly is probably the biggest problem that we sometimes have. Uh, the third thing is we're going to say that all collisions uh, are elastic, fully elastic. Now, there's a good reason for why we're saying that. If the collisions aren't elastic, then we're going to be losing energy somewhere, and that's insane. And it turns out that collisions all being elastic is a pretty good uh, assumption of how things really work. And then the last one, this is also quite important. Uh, we're going to say that the collision time with a surface of the container is negligible. That means that the time it takes colliding into the wall is practically zero, um, and we can treat it as this. And those assumptions are really, really important um, to get an idea of what's happening. So let's think about what's actually causing pressure. You've done this loads of times before, so it should be fairly simple. Um, I'm just going to draw in for you a wall. There's a wall, so this is all we can say a container like this. Here's our container. Um, what we have inside of our container oops, is a series of particles, and we're going to treat the particles like tiny little balls. 
um, they don't really have uh, their point particles so I've drawn them with a volume there obviously so we can see it but in the real world um, you wouldn't really see them moving at all now what's happening inside that uh, object is that this particle is moving around randomly. It's going bedoying off a wall, bedoying off a wall, bedoying off a wall, and just constantly moving around, following this path, bouncing around with random motion. And it's the fact that it's colliding with this wall and bouncing off it that's causing the pressure. Every time it hits the wall, um, there's a momentum change. So that's causing a force on the area and a force over an area is of course a pressure. So the next thing to think about then is, well, how fast is this going? This is what we're trying to we're trying to answer. So if we want to know the speed of an individual particle, um, it starts off by you think, oh god, that's going to be impossible, um, because if I draw this as the frequency number of particles and um, this as their velocity, you should remember from when we talked about Brownian motion. I'm going to see a curve something like that. So there's going to be a random distribution of uh, speeds, but they'll all center around one common average speed. And I'm going to put, call that C with a hat on uh, because it would be an average speed. Um, and again, so you should sort of remember um, that if I have a higher temperature gas, then this shifts that way. If I have a low temperature gas, then it shifts to look like that. Um, so what happens is, with different temperatures, the average velocity shifts, but there's still always a distribution of different speeds. So off the bat, it's going to look a little bit tricky. Um, but there's some things that we can do. The first thing we know is we're going to make a generalization. Um, and what we're going to say is that the velocity of the particle is the root mean squared. Now I'm going to call that CRMS, um, and that gets a bit confusing, so I'm going to say C squared with a hat on it. That means the, that's another way of saying RMS. Um, sorry, I might separate these out so it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. Uh, we're well, still grouping everything together. Um, so just remember that, that that's, it looks like a division, it's not a division. It's um, This is one way of writing it, this is a different way of including the hat. So C hat, I'll write it over here. C hat squared. Now that's the average velocity of a particle. So we're going to start off by assuming it's an utterly typical single particle. So I've got my utterly typical single particle with a velocity of c hat squared. Now what does, how do we actually represent velocity? Um, velocity itself will be a three-dimensional vector. And you know that probably in the x, y, and z coordinates. So it's going to have a component in each of these three vectors. Um, so I'm going to rewrite this, and again it's going to look a bit weird, but this is the way that it's kind of standard, the standard derivation goes. So if you're looking at other things on the internet to help you, um, this is probably the same terminology you'll see, which is why I'm doing it that way. What we can say is that the uh, average velocity, c squared, will be u squared plus v squared plus w squared. Um, and what that means is I've got a component in the x, a component in the y, and a component in the z. Now, this is where we're going to make our second simplification. What we're going to say is, okay, let's consider a particle in a box. So there's the box. I'm going to draw it like that. And I'm going to put a particle in there. Now, the, what I'm going to do is label um, the edges of this. So I'm going to say, that it has a length in the x direction, a length in the y direction, and a length in the z direction. So um, the, we could say, for example, then, that the volume of the box is Lx times Ly times Lz. 
Um, and those lengths are going to turn out to be quite important. But it's nice because it's kind of a generic uh, cuboid volume. Now, thinking about our little gas particle bouncing around there, it's moving around with a velocity, and we're going to say it's got velocity u. Um, and we're just going to, for now, think about uh, its, what it's doing in the x direction. So my particle will come along here, and it's going to collide with the wall. And when it does collide with the wall, um, it will bounce off it. So it'll do something like this. I'm going to draw another particle over here so it's doing everything. We'll let me move it around. And then, come here. And it's joined everything together. So let's see if I can ungroup it. There we go. Right, here's my little particle then. It's going to come down, move in this direction, and go bounce off the wall and go back the other way. Now, there's a couple of useful things that we can say from that. Um, we can say that at the wall, the momentum is changing. We also know that force is equal to rate of change of momentum. And hopefully then you'll remember that pressure is force divided by area. So looking at this, we can start to say, okay, all I need to do is work out the momentum at that point, and I'm going to start to be able to get a pressure. So what we're going to do is think about a particle colliding with a wall. So here's my particle at the start. We're going to say it has a mass of m, and it has a velocity of u1. And it's going to collide with my wall over here. Um, so this is before the collision. After the collision, there's my wall. Uh, and my particle will be moving away from that wall now with velocity u2. And it will still have a mass of m. Now, um, the momentum before will be therefore u1m, and the momentum after will be negative u2m. Now, do you remember what we said? We said before that uh, one of our assumptions is all collisions, say it with me now, are elastic. Because the collision is completely elastic, there's no energy lost, which means that the velocity will be exactly the same. I can say that u1, or the absolute value of u1, is equal to the absolute value of u2. Therefore, um, I can say that momentum change will be 2mu, because it turns out that these u's are exactly the same. So I've got a momentum change of 2mu at that wall. So I've got my statement saying that the momentum change during a collision is 2mu. What can I really do about that? Well, I'm just going to think about it in one dimension now. In one dimension, there's my particle, and it's bouncing around off that wall. And it's kind of going, bounce off that wall, bounce off that wall, bounce off that wall, bounce off that wall. We're only thinking, remember, about one dimension so far. Well, inside that one dimension, I said earlier that I'm going to give the box length lx. So if I want to know the rate of change of momentum, I need to know how many of these 2mu momentum changes am I getting in one second. Now, we know that the speed of the particle is u. I also know that speed is equal to distance over time. So it's a pretty easy jump to say, OK, well, I know that the speed is u. Um, and if I want to find the time taken to go from hitting the wall here 
traveling back to here and hitting this wall again because remember I'm only interested in the pressure on one wall to start with. So the time between hitting this wall, it will go start the timer as it hits the wall, it'll go that way and it'll come back again. So my distance therefore must be 2LX over time. Rearrange that and I get that the time between each collision will be 2LX divided by u, which again is the velocity in the x component. Now I can think of this uh, t here, I've put a little t to start with, but actually this is a bit like saying it's the time period. It's the time taken for a single collision. If I want to know the collisions per second, well, something per second is just a frequency. So I can say collision per second will be 1 over that time period, because it's like getting the frequency. Therefore, I can say that the, I'm going to call it f for the frequency of collisions, it will be just the inverse, 1 over it. So it's u divided by 2lx. So that's a frequency of collisions. If you think back to earlier, earlier I said that the momentum change I'll put delta momentum is 2mu. So now what I'm going to say is the momentum change per second will be equal to the momentum change in a single collision multiplied by the number of collisions per second. So I'm going to get momentum change per second or dm by dt, that's going to be uh, 2mu multiplied by u over 2lx, which simplifies to, uh, no, two's cancel, sorry, simplifies to mu squared over lx. So I've got this equation now saying that the rate of change in momentum, or the force on the wall, because remember force is rate of change in momentum, you can say the force is mu squared over lx. Now remember what we're dealing with here. We've just been working out the pressure for the force on this wall here. So we've been in the box with lx and we're saying that our particle has been smashing into this wall. And what I've worked out is due to my single particle, the force on this wall. Now, I know that force is equal to pressure divided by area, um, which means that, sorry, what am I talking about? Idiot. Uh, I know that pressure is force divided by area. Um, I've got my force up here, that's F. So I just need to find the area of the wall. Now that's really easy to find because I said that this is Ly and this is Lz. So it just becomes pressure will be mu squared divided by Lx divided by the area. Now the area is Ly times Lz. If I simplify that, I get mu squared over Lx ly lz. What is that? That's mu squared divided by the volume. Now that's taken us somewhere pretty profound. That's telling us that the pressure in a container depends on the speed of the particle, the mass of the particle, the volume of the container. And all of that is completely intuitively obvious, but we've worked it out from really simple principles just using a little bit of maths. And that's pretty cool. However, so far we've only been dealing with a single particle. So let's give it some friends. So we want to find the total uh, pressure or the pressure total. Now, the pressure total will be the contribution from each and every single particle. Um, now, each particle, for, for the moment, we're going to assume has the same mass. 
So I'm going to say that if they're all the same type of gas, then it will be mu squared. This will be mu1 squared divided by volume. That's not going to change. And I'm going to add on the momentum contribution from the second particle. Again, volume doesn't change. All the way up to uh, the momentum change from the nth particle. Um, now you can see there's a lot of things that are the same in this, so it becomes, uh, we can simplify it out a little bit and just say it will be m over v lots of uh, the sum of the squares of all the particles. And you might start to despair at that point and go, well, I know from the, look, from the chemistry that I remember that there are going to be billions upon billions upon billions of particles. So how on earth am I going to work out what's happening? Ah, well, there's a neat little trick that we're going to use. What we're going to say is, well, let's think back to when we were thinking about uh, our velocity RMS. An RMS velocity is equal to the sum of the squares of all of the particles. Now, that means that I can say, if I put this little hat on it and say it's the sum of all the squares, that is equal to u1 squared plus u2 squared plus what up to un squared, and that's the average divided by n. Now that's very simple because that means that I can replace everything I've written with just u bar squared. Now it sounds like a bit of a cheat, but I promise you it's not. So I can say that the pressure, the total pressure, will be m minus v times m u bar squared. Now, why is this important? This equation is incredibly cool. What we've now said is for any number of particles, provided those particles all have the same mass, then we can work out the pressure component of them. But it actually turns out it's not quite that simple. Because what we've found so far is the pressure component caused by their x component of velocity. But Sadly, they don't just have an x component of velocity, they have different components of velocity. So, I would suggest at this point you probably want to pause your video, have a think, have a little calm down, and then we will move on shortly. Okay, I hope you have taken a break because we're diving straight back into it. So, at the moment, we're only dealing with uh, the velocity in the x component. And you might think, oh god, if I've got to go through this all again for different directions and work out something crazy, but actually, no, 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 it's not that bad. It's not as bad as you think. Um, what did we say earlier? We said that c hat squared is u hat squared plus v hat squared plus w hat squared. Now, if you go back to our list of rules that we came up with before we did this, we also said that there is no preferred direction of travel. In other words, the gas particles move quite happily in all directions. That's very really important because what that means is that on average, all the components, I don't know why I did it in that order, but, but all of the components are equal to each other. So it's perfectly okay to say that the overall velocity is just three lots. Of u hat squared. This is this c here is the average, but u is exactly the same as all the others. So when I work out the total velocity by combining all my three vectors together, I can just do u three times because on average for a proper gas it should be the same. Well, that means that I can rewrite this as saying u hat squared is equal to c hat squared divided by 3. And now I can get rid of this term up here, which was just in the x component, and replace it with this term, 
which is in all three components. So I get that in the real world, in a three-dimensional box, the pressure is mm average speed squared divided by three times the volume. And this is pretty cool um, because I can do a little next step and I can say PV is equal to NM C hat squared divided by three. Oops. Sorry, divided by three. Now why is that important? Well it's really important because I can also say, remember from way way earlier, PV is equal to NKT, where N is the number of particles, K is the bulk, sorry, the molar gas constant, and T is the temperature. Now these two PVs are the same. So therefore I can say that Nm C hat squared over 3 is equal to NKT. Um, that's, that's getting pretty cool. Um, simplify it a little bit more. I can say that uh, I can cancel the ends. So I can get 1 over 3 MC average squared is equal to KT. Now, here's the really, really cool part. What you might notice is a third MC squared or m velocity squared, that looks very, very close to, uh, well, it's looking, it's looking very, very close to kinetic energy. So what could we do? Could we, could we find something profound from that? Absolutely. Because there is absolutely nothing wrong by multiplying both sides of an equation by 3 over 2. Remember, the basic rules of algebra is an equation is always valid so long as you do the same thing to both sides. So if I do that, I end up with 1 over 3, and I'm just going to do the, uh, the multiplication here, 1 over 3 times 3 over 2 times mc bar squared is equal to 3 over 2 kt. What? does that simplify to? That simplifies to a half mc squared is equal to 3 over 2 kt. This is something very profound and very important. What we have discovered is that the average kinetic energy of a gas Sorry, of a gas particle, a single gas particle is 3 over 2 kT. Um, what does that tell us? It tells us that for any gas, its kinetic energy depends solely on temperature. Now, if you think about it a little bit more, that makes total sense because we know that temperature is just a measure of how quickly the particles are moving. If temperature is just a measure of how quickly the particles are moving, then of course the kinetic energy of the gas will only depend on temperature. But how cool is this? Using just some really simple maths, um, okay, we chained it together in a way that it became very not simple in the middle, but you haven't done anything more than, you know, kind of year nine level algebra. We've worked out that the temperature of a gas is just its kinetic energy. And we haven't done anything weird or crazy to get there. We've just used basic principles of physics. Um, and that's what's so beautiful about this subject. Um, these sorts of questions that you come up with, they will often ask you um, to explain steps along this path. So you don't need to remember the whole thing in every stage but you do need to be able to recreate these um, in sections so my advice to you is to make sure that you can write out these steps uh, in a fairly logical order um, and that you are totally prepared to do questions that rely on any of these phases um, Isaac Physics is your friend here there's loads of other questions that we'll be setting on there as well as past paper questions but if you've understood this so far 
Really well done to you. This is probably the hardest bit of A-level physics there is. Um, so by all means, go back, have another look through everything, watch through the video again. Any bits that you're not sure about, I need you to make some notes. And then in our lesson, I want you to come in and talk to me about it and say um, which areas you're finding tricky, which areas you found okay. Um, and that's how you're going to absolutely smash your A-level. Really well done for watching, guys.